We have our list of objectives, right? That's what we're going to talk about over today and tomorrow. Um, okay, so conduction system. I, you know, I'm a logical thinker and a process thinker, so I, I kind of like to give you the biggest picture possible first um, early on. Okay, so what do we, the conduction system, first let me give you an answer. The conduction system is a set of specialized cells found in the musculature of the heart that evolved to conduct action potentials, all right? They're kind of like nerves, but they're not nerves. They're cardiomyocytes, but they're cardiomyocytes that don't have contraction elements, like they don't have sarcomeres and stuff. Instead, they're cardiomyocytes that have evolved to just transmit an action potential from one place to another. So it's, they do similar to what a nerve does, only there's no information processing. It's all or nothing, okay? So why do we have a conduction system? Well, ultimately, in order for our heart to work at its best, we need a few things to happen, all right? Number one, we need the muscle cells of the atria to contract at the same time. Why? Because it's surrounding a pool of blood. If they don't contract at the same time, they're never gonna move anything, okay? So first, we need the atria to contract together. Same with the ventricles. Remember the ventricles and the atria are made up of oodles and oodles of cells. So we need all those cells to work together and contract at the same time. Otherwise, we're not gonna have cardiac output. So we need the muscle cells to work together. The conduction system does this job by spreading out the signal to contract to a bunch of muscle cells in a very short amount of time so that they can be coordinated and contract together. Okay, so that's the first reason we have this system. Okay, then we have an order of events problem. The atria need to contract before the ventricles contract. To do it the other way around doesn't make any sense, right? Why would you fill up a contracting ventricle, right? So the atria need to contract first, and then the ventricles need to contract. That means that we need a delay of some kind between atrial contraction and ventricular contraction. We have a specialized organ in the heart just for that called the AV node. The AV node delays the contraction signal enough for the atria to contract before the ventricles contract, okay? And then finally, we need the heart to contract frequently, not too frequently, but frequently, without nervous stimulation to do so. One of the things that makes the heart fascinating is it does not require the brain to function. This has a huge survival advantage, right? Because brains are great big complicated things that lots and lots of things can go wrong with. So having a heart that is independent of the brain increases our survivability. Okay, so what does this system look like? <clears throat> it's typically represented like this in pictures. What I want you to understand is when you open up the heart in the anatomy lab, you are not gonna see these pathways, okay? They look just like every other cell in that area. But functionally, we do have these pathways of these specialized conducting system cells. All right, so uh, the first region that we're gonna talk about is right here. This is the sinus node or the sinoatrial node. It is the typical pacemaker for the heart, the, the place where the um, heart rate is typically set. It's a relatively small area, very small fibers with no contractility, directly connected to the atrial wall. Okay, connecting the SA node to the rest of the atria are the internodal pathways. Okay, I have a better picture of those coming. Um, from internodal pathways, so from atria, we then arrive at the AV node, which sits between the top and the bottom of the heart, okay, between the atria and the ventricles. The AV node um, then uh, proceeds into the AV bundle, the AV bundle splits into a left and right bundle branch. Uh, they go down the interventricular septum, make the corner, and they end in what are called Purkinje fibers. These are, would be Purkinje fibers down here. Okay, so some characteristics of these cells. They all self-excite, 
okay? Um, and we'll talk more about that when we talk about the train analogy in a minute. The rusting membrane potential of these cells is a little higher, a little closer to zero than the ventricular muscle fiber cells. This is because they're more leaky to sodium. Now, this is a good thing because it means that these cells are more, will contract more quickly or will activate more quickly than the surrounding cells were. It helps to keep things coordinated. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, that relatively high membrane potential, it means that the sodium channels in these are mostly inactivated. Um, so the, uh, the action potential that we, re that we see is more heavily governed by the slow calcium channels. And that's as far down that rabbit hole as I'm gonna go with this, okay? So what's up there is all I'm asking you to know about the different receptor proteins, yes. Oh, this guy, you mean? Yeah. Um, no, this is the accessory bundle, okay? The inner nodal pathways, we can't see them on the other side because it's covered, um, but there's a better picture coming up that shows the left atrium a little bit better. Um, this is that same information, different picture, right? SA node, inner nodal pathways. If we could flip the heart around, the inner nodal pathways would look just the same on the other side, right? Um, to the AV node, from AV node down through the um, AV bundle, and then uh, onward. Okay, so what does this look like in process? Okay, so here is a heart in diastole. The SA node is going to activate, right? That um, signal for activation kind of spreads around the atria, so it is including both left and right, okay? It spreads that um, connection or excitation um, eventually arrives at the AV node. The AV node holds on to it for a short amount of time. Okay, so we see a hundred millisecond delay here. And then the conduction signal moves down through the um, intraventricular septum and then back up through the Purkinje fibers. And then what follows is uh, contraction. So what we're seeing here in purple is depolarization or electrical excitation. We haven't contracted yet. Depolarization precedes contraction, okay? Like we talked about with the EKG always comes first, EKG changes come first. All right, so if we zoom in and look at a sinoatrial node fiber, that's here in red, all right? Now this, is a different pattern than we've seen before. Because here, instead of having a resting potential that's flat, we, here we have a resting potential that is angled upwards. This is the leaky sodium channels, right? So after an action potential, um, you know, we're, we're in our potassium is uh, going rushing out, right? Then we get our refractory period, sodium potassium pump, that's down here then this area, sodium is leaking out of the cell. As it leaks out of the cell, the membrane potential gets a little higher, a little higher, a little higher. Well, when we hit minus 40, that's the threshold. So that's where the voltage-gated sodium channels start to play a role. And then we get our big upstroke and we repeat that whole thing again. This is a very different pattern than what we see in ventricular muscle, which is the action potential we looked at yesterday. Do you see here's that plateau phase that we talked about? The SA nodal fibers don't have that plateau phase, um, which makes sense because they don't contract. So there's no reason to put calcium in these cells because there's nothing for it to affect and make contract anyway. Um, <clears throat> so we have uh, the comparison essentially and that these automatically depolarize. Now, one of the ways the autonomic nervous system affects heart rate is by affecting the angle of this leak right here. If we made the sodium channels a lot more leaky, this angle is going to be much um, sharper, and therefore these cells will depolarize much faster. See how that works? Um, parasympathetic nervous system tends to drive down the resting potential, 
which means it takes longer to get back up to threshold. That slows the heart rate down. Okay, so um, believe it or not, these, this channel theory re really does help us sometimes. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about timing here. Okay, so here's our conduction system, right? From SA node to AV node, all right, is that's about 0.1, sorry, that's about 0.03 milliseconds, right? Then the AV node is adding a lot of delay. Look at that, from 0.03 to 0.12. I know those are small numbers, but that's almost a 100 millisecond delay. That's like forever in physiology terms. And then from the AV node through the rest of the ventricle, again, very short. So what it means is that the AV node delays the impulse that it has received from the SA node for long enough that the atria contract before the signal is sent for ventricular contraction. This is part of that requirement of having the atria contract first and then the ventricles contract after that. So our AV nodal delay is shown, basically shown here in the timing differences. Now, once we get into the ventricles, um, the conduction of action potential gets even faster. The, the left and right bundle branch and the Purkinje fibers, they're big beefy fibers that really conduct action potential very rapidly. And they evolved to do that. And the, the reason that they're able to conduct so quickly is they have lots and lots of gap junctions. The AV node, on the other hand, has relatively few gap junctions. So it kind of takes forever for the signal to work its way through. Once you're through the AV node, though, in the um, bundle branches, lots of gap junctions, so very rapid um, transmission of action potential. Um, the AV bundle delay and the, the relative um, paucity or the, 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 the relative absence of gap junctions also means that it's very difficult for conduction signal to travel backwards through the AV node. Um, it works like kind of a one-way valve. Um, so the total time between the AV node and the end of the Purkinje fibers, 0.03 seconds. So that's 30 milliseconds. That's super fast, right? Then what follows from that stimulation is um, contraction. So the conduction system brings in the excitation. That excitation then leads muscle cells to have action potentials that look more like this and cause um, calcium to enter and, cal and contraction to actually occur. So if we look at that in numbers, right, here's our SA node. So from SA node to AV node, we're at like you know, 0 0.03, 0 0.05, 0 0.07. Then um, by the time we get to the bundle branches, we're at 0 0.16. Why? Because we ate 100 milliseconds right there. Okay, a 0.1. And then from um, 0.16 all the way back out is 0.03. So very, very fast. Short delay between AV node and um, uh, ventricles. Long delay between SA node and, uh, and, the, and past the AV node. Okay, so in my a little three-minute talk here on um, the pacemaker system. So you have, in the conducting system is made up of lots and lots of cells, all right? It turns out that evolution has given us a kind of safeguard system against the heart just stopping because of no um, signal for contraction. And the way it goes is like this. Every cell in the conducting system contracts automatically. It's not contracts. Every cell in the conducting system depolarizes automatically. It's, it excites automatically. However, the rate of self-depolarization gets longer and longer as you go from SA node out to ventricle. Okay, so what that means is cells here in the Purkinje fibers, they will automatically depolarize at like a rate of 15 beats per minute. So very, very slow right? The cells here in the bundle branches, they'll, depo they'll depolarize at about 30 or 35 beats per minute. The SA node, 60 to 70 beats per minute. 
So the further we go from SA node out to ventricle, the longer the time it takes for that cell to auto depolarize. So how does that relate to the rate of the heart at any given time? This is where the train analogy comes in. The heart will beat at the speed of the fastest pacemaker, okay? And that's why we talk about it as a train. You know, if you had a train with three engines, one engine's going 70, one's going 50, and one's going 30, well, how fast is the train gonna go? As fast as the fastest engine, right? Well, <clears throat> so that's the SA node, you know, 60 beats per minute. Well, let's say something goes wrong. We have a heart attack, we knock out the SA node. So does the hot heart stop beating? No, because the AV nodal cells will still beat at 50 beats per minute or 40 beats per minute. Now, is that compatible with life? Barely, but it's better than being dead, right? Okay, <clears throat> well, what about a more complicated example? The third example is what we call a heart block. This is where the AV node has dropped out. It's sick, it's not conducting potentials anymore. So what we get is we get essentially two pacemakers for the same heart. Our SA node is cruising along at 70 miles an hour, but it's only getting the atria to contract. Not very useful, right? Not compatible with life unless you have the ventricles contracting too. Well, if the AV node is, is busted, well, what will the heart beat at? The Purkinje fibers will beat at 15 to 20 beats per minute, 30 miles an hour, we'll say, right? So it means that you've got the atria are beating at one rate and the ventricles are beating at a much slower rate in a heart block, right? <clears throat> or last example, because I'm out of time. Let's say you have a broken area of um, this conduction system that's auto depolarizing really, really fast. So in this case, we're gonna pick on a Purkinje fiber and we're gonna say it's, it's beating at 140 beats per minute. Well, how fast is the heart going to go? It's going to have a tendency, if all the other wiring is healthy, it's going to have a tendency to go at 140 beats per minute. We call that an ectopic focus. In other words, the SA node ain't in charge. Another area of the heart is controlling the rate and isn't doing so in a healthy way. Okay? Okay. So if the SA node is the pacemaker in the normal heart, and remember, that's typically what we talk about in this class is the normals. Um, <clears throat> well, how, does that, how is that pacemaker affected by the autonomic nervous system that we talked about earlier this week? Okay, so we'll start with parasympathetic because it's a little easier to understand. Parasympathetic stimulation to the SA node arrives through the vagus nerves, right? The, the vagi properly. Um, <clears throat> and that uh, innervation or that excitement by the parasympathetic system, it causes the release of acetylcholine. That should be no surprise, right? Because we're at the end effector of the, of the parasympathetic. So the acetylcholine here is, activates a uh, chemically gated potassium channel. So usually we've seen acet acetylcholine attached to a sodium channel right? Sodium channel opens, sodium comes rushing in, we get a depolarization. Well, in the heart, um, we get an acetylcholine-gated potassium channel instead. So now when acetylcholine is released, potassium channels open, that causes an increase in potassium permeability. Okay, so all the way back now to our membrane potential talk, when potassium channels are open, potassium goes rushing out, that drives the cell into hyperpolarization, right? Profoundly negative. Well, the SA nodal cells, if their baseline uh, membrane potential goes down, they are gonna depolarize less often, right? So same amount of sodium leak that we talked about yesterday, but we've lowered the resting membrane potential. So now it takes longer for the SA nodal cells to self-depolarize. We see that in the patient as an increase in, well, as a decrease in heart rate. In other words, the time between beats goes up, right? So the total rate goes down. Now, acetylcholine does another thing, which is to increase the delay at the AV node, 
Remember yesterday we talked about AV node delays this, the conduction signal by about 100 milliseconds. Well, when the parasympathetic division is activated, the AV nodal delay goes up. This makes sense because the heart rate is slower. So the heart is beating less fast, so we need a longer delay to make sure the atria contract before the ventricles contract, right? So we get two effects by the parasympathetic system. Now the sympathetic system um, through norepinephrine and beta-1 adrenergic receptors, which we talked about the other day, beta-1, one heart, right? The ones are stimulatory. So here, the beta-1 activation by norepinephrine from the sympathetic system causes an increase in permeability to both sodium and calcium. Okay, so you understand already what those two things do. Increasing the sodium permeability raises the baseline membrane potential and makes the cell depolarize more quickly. All right, so now each heartbeat is closer together. So we have an increase in heart rate. Now the other important bit is an increase in calcium permeability at the same time triggers not only an increase in rate, but an increase in contraction strength. Because remember, it's calcium entering from the outside that causes the, uh, the sarcomeres to begin to contract in the first place. So if we increase our calcium permeability, we increase our contractility, how hard or tightly or with how much force the heart is able to contract. So with the sympathetic system, we not only get a rate change, but we also get a strength change. We don't have that in the parasympathetic. Like parasympathetic doesn't affect the calcium side of things. It only affects the membrane potential. Now the other bit that the sympathetic nervous system does is it causes a decrease in the AV nodal delay. So um, opposite the parasympathetic. Again, that makes sense because a, a faster heart rate needs a shorter delay in order for the coordination to occur. All right, so parasympathetic and sympathetic have effects at the heart, even though they don't directly control or trigger contraction. All right, get your Kahoot device out. And All right, question number one. Resting membrane potential in the SA node decreases from minus 55 to minus 70. Which of these will be true? All right, good showing. Yeah, the heart will beat slower. So a lower resting membrane potential means that it will take longer for auto depolarization to occur, right? So a longer time between beats is gonna be a slower heart rate. Okay, good. Next up. Why is the conduction signal delayed in the AV node? Not how, but why? Yeah, to allow the atria to contract before the ventricles. I laid that out as one of the things we need the conduction system to do, and the AV nodal delay accomplishes that. Now, how does it do that? The AV node delays the signal because it has a relative deficit of gap junctions, right? So many fewer gap junctions make that signal of depolarization slower to pass through. Generally, we call the AV nodal delay about 100 milliseconds, right? So that's 0.1 of a second. And when we talk about EKG here later, you'll see that delay. Ooh, I'm not sure what a fuzzy dolphin would look like, but <laughs> not very hydrodynamic. All right, conduction in the AV bundle is, which of those terms?
Oh, ho, ho. AV bundle is not the AV node, right? The AV node is very slow. The AV bundle emerges from the AV node and then splits into the left and right bundle branches down through the interventricular septum, right? And conduction in the AV bundle is very fast, okay? So AV node versus AV bundle. Did you say the AV node is very slow, though? The AV node is slow. But in, but in respect to the rest of the body, is it slow? The, still pretty dang fast? No, the AV bundle is one of the fastest conducting places in the body. So it's fast no matter what. Because we go from AV node all the way out to Purkinje fibers in like uh, 10 milliseconds, yeah. 0.01. Mm -hmm. So that's fast, really fast. Like fast, like myelinated neurons are fast. All right, last one. A conducting cell is auto depolarizing at a rate of 120. What will the heart rate be? All right, good, 120. That's the train analogy that we talked about. The heart rate that we see is going to be determined by the fastest conducting cell that's uh, setting the pace. So normally, typically, that's SA nodal cells, right? And those are under the control of the sympathetic and parasympathetic system. But if you have a sick heart, you can have what's called an ectopic focus an area of the conducting system that's beating real fast and is actually driving the whole heart rate to be, or the whole heart to beat much faster. Okay, so um, what we would call one example of this clinically is what we call supraventricular tachycardia, where we have an area of the heart that's beating real fast, but it's high enough in the heart that it's being conducted to the whole heart. So this is somebody who presents with a heart rate of 210 or something like that, right? And while, you know, to, you, you can live with a heart rate of 210, but you wouldn't want to do it for very long. Okay. All right, let's see who our winners are. I do skip the animation here. Fuzzy Dolphin, yay, was the winner. Good. 